Morning. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Good morning. The tomb 
Psalm 4. Answer me when I call, O God of my life. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, you people, shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. When you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it on your bed and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and wine abound. I will both lie down and sleep. 
You proved your redeeming love and destroyed the power that death held over us. Together, by the power of your spirit, come upon us now as the risen one, that we may rejoice in the gift of salvation, Jesus has won for us, and be filled with your endless love that brings peace to all. Amen. We all sin and fall short of God's glory. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And since our sins are forgiven in Christ, let us also forgive one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. At this time, you're invited to share this peace with your neighbors and friends. The ancient Christian greeting, the peace of Christ be with you.
love when we're talking about Jesus and God? If I had to put into words what peace means for us today, I would say that peace kind of means that we're happy, we're kind of calm, we're not hungry, we're not mad, we're kind of just good. And that is what Jesus wants for us. He says that a lot when we talk about peace a lot in the Bible. And so we're going to go learn about that more. And I have a special surprise back in the room that we haven't seen. It's all new. It's not new to the church. We, we borrowed it from downstairs, guys. But it's new to our children's room. So we're going to go back and, and see what that is and learn more from our story today about when Jesus talked to the disciples. But before we do that, let's go ahead and pray. I want everybody to take this big, deep breath for us. We can be at John. Mm. Dear God, thank you for all of our peace, and thank you for when we feel happy and calm and not hungry and not thirsty, and when we just feel good. Those moments are so, so nice, and please help us to be so at peace today and have so much fun. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, oh yes. What do you see?
What is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. So in the name of the Lord Jesus, praise be to God. Thank <laughs> you. 
honor to be with you again this morning and to wrestle with these great lessons, so I want to thank you for this opportunity. I also want to say that um, while my sermon today might be a little bit on the shorter side once again, um, it made me think a little bit about what I actually told my actors this past week for the show that I just finished directing. Um, so we opened the show just this past Friday for this weekend and next weekend, and in the lead up to the show, which is very funny by the way, it was a super fun weekend, um, we were having some issues with pacing, and uh, there were parts of it that were kind of dragging a little bit, so the actors were kind of being a little more hesitant than they needed to be, and so I told them something, they laughed at it, but it actually helped, is I said to them, you know, I've never seen a play that was too short. <laughs> seen a lot of plays that were too long, so let's maybe pick up the pace a little bit. <laughs> um, so with that, here we go. So I'll be the first to admit that I had some challenges with this week's um, liturgies. Our, our passage from Acts in particular was kind of a lot to digest for me, so I, I, I did a little bit of digging. Um, so some setup here. So this passage begins with Peter. So Peter begins his temple sermon by pointing out the continuity of the resurrected Christ and his young church with God's plan for his faithful people from all the way from the time of Abraham. And then he then calls on the Israelites to repent and to turn to God so that their sins may be wiped out. In order to wrestle with what we can glean from such a lesson in our liturgy this week, the third week of Easter, I was struck by a passage that I found um, by Rabbi Shemuel ben Nachmani, who says, we do not see things as they are, we see things as we are. And Stephanie Buchanan, who's a biblical scholar affiliated with the Chicago Theological Seminary, had this to say about Rabbi Nachmani's passage. She says, quote, this Talmudic quote, which again is, we do not see things as they are, we see we are. This quote from Rabbi Shmuel ben Nachmani notes that seeing is not always vision. What we see in life is more than what the eye beholds, and that a person or circumstances right in front of us can be merely the surface of someone or something more profound. End quote. And it seems to me that in recounting Peter's sermon in the Consider where Peter is coming from in this call to Israelites. To see Peter, if that is possible, for who he is, rather than as we might read in this passage. We must remember that this is the same Peter who denied knowing Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. And you may remember that after that third denial, Peter hears the rooster crow and recalls the prediction as Jesus. This final incident is known as the repentance of Peter. So in, in Peter's calling for the repentance of others, might this be a continuation, in a way, of his own repentance? Maybe. And if so, might there be instances where we need to repent for our own wrongdoing, or, for lack of a better term, because I sure couldn't find it, wrong thinkings? Now, in case it wasn't blatantly obvious in the children's message. Um, I don't know if any of you know, but um, Emily and I are the parents of two incredible children, Ivy and Ellie, kind of mess out of there, because they're all in the movie. Now, full disclosure, when Emily and I first became parents, we were ecstatic. We were also frightened. We were over the moon, and also panic-stricken. We were giddy, we were freaking out, everything, all of it, all together. I'm sure you get the picture. But Emily and I are also the children so, as such, we dove headfirst into parenting books and articles and all sorts of material. We didn't know what we were doing. But no matter what parenting philosophy we read or approach or any of that, there was one truth that came through in everything that we read, and it was that sometimes you're going to get it wrong. <laughs> Actually, I'm sorry, that's an edit. A lot of times you're going to get it wrong. I misread that, I'm sorry. A lot of times you're going to get it wrong. Um, Repentance, either his own repentance or in his 
calling for others' repentance, let's not forget that repentance is not merely words. It is not the act of simply saying you're sorry or apologizing, but perhaps more importantly, the actions that follow after that. One way to look at it, and one approach that we learned from, of all places, Daniel Piper, <laughs> was that, and there's a song about it too, I won't sing it, trust me, I'll, say, I'll spare you, is that uh, saying I'm sorry is the first step. Continuing on in the liturgy, we have 1 John chapter 3. So to continue on this thread of children and childhood and what that means, the author of this letter calls believers to or calls all believers to righteous living because God has loved us so much that he has claimed us and renamed us as children of God. In our passage today, as I understood it, part of it reads, Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. And another portion reads, Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Now it might seem, maybe in fantasized intervals, to see oneself as a child, but you might notice that it, in the passage it says, Everyone who does what is right is righteous and not anyone who does wrong at any point is unrighteous. Meaning, it can seem so easy sometimes to forgive children for their mistakes, right? They're learning, after all. But the blessing of our faith as Christians, and the blessing that our faith gives us as Christians, is the freedom to come back to righteousness when we ourselves deviate from God, and we will we see ourselves as the best parts of what it means to be a child, curious, passionate, playful, and most importantly, empathetic creatures that they are, well, I think we have a lot that we can learn from them as children of God. And then as we pivot to our gospel lesson, according to Luke, Jesus here seems to invite his disciples to test the reality of the resurrection with this reality being established through things like touching and feeding, very tangible, material things, if you will. And Jesus opens their minds and calls them to bear witness to the truth, revealed and experienced by them. But what are we to gather from Luke's telling in this exchange? Well, one approach that I read that I, I really resonated with me this week as I was looking through things was actually from someone named Pastor James Warren, with the First Lutheran Church of, oh boy, this is a mouthful, I want to make sure I get it right, Albemarle, First Lutheran Church of Albemarle, which is in North Carolina. So the way he interprets this passage, he highlights three key points. The first is that the Messiah is to suffer and rise from the dead. The second is the repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed. And the third is you are witnesses of these now, we've already gathered in our previous worship services on Easter Sunday and the second Sunday in Easter about the first part. And the repentance and forgiveness of sins is an invaluable part of our reading today from Acts, as recounted in Peter's sermon. But it's that third key point right at the end of the reading that really struck with me and seems to street, um, strike with us in Acts <coughs> in North Carolina, which is the passage that says, to be a witness to these things. Now, the phrasing of to be a witness has a bit of an air of passivity in our modern world. You know, when I think of being a witness, you might think of um, witnessing, being a witness at a ceremony or perhaps being a witness to a crime on exam or, so, or something like that. But, but consider what it means to be a witness if we look at it through the lens of a child. See, children have an immensely heightened sense of observation. Because everything's so new to them. They're so apt to see things as they are, as we learned from Rabbi Nachman. So I'm reading a book right now entitled, um, it's a book titled, a very sort of poignant title. It's called, You're Not Listening, 
what you're missing and why it matters. I provided some journalism paper on racism. And in the book, she goes into the multitude of ways that we block out, make assumptions, jump to conclusions, interrupt, or flat out just not listen when we engage with other people. Whether those people be friends, <coughs> co-workers, children, or in the case of the faithful, even God. And that disconnect <coughs> can lead us to loneliness, exclusion, fear, anger, isolation. <coughs> but when we open ourselves up to bear witness, we can become far more receptive to the love of the world and the world. Just this past week, I was talking to Ivy about her school day, and she was talking to me about a kid at her school who um, was um, chewing on something that belonged to her. And immediately, I, had to, I jumped to this conclusion. I made this assumption about this kid teasing Ivy or bullying her in some way. And so I kind of asked her for more information about what was going on. And Ivy simply said, very calmly, well, that's just Jacob. <laughs> His brain just works a little differently. In the mouth of babes, amen? Mm -hmm. So immediately I felt this need to repent for my assumptions about a child with special needs that my daughter, without a second's hesitation, was able to bear witness. So it's with that, it's with moments like that in all of our readings this week that I ask all of us to today to, to consider, including myself, what are the ways that God might be speaking to us that we're not listening to? How can we be more receptive to, as the Jesuits put so clearly in their teachings, how can we be more receptive to seeing God in everything? How might we repent for our own misgivings with not just words, Apologies, but in our actions. How might we bear witness this week to the good news of the resurrection of Christ? How might we take what we observe in others and use it as an opportunity to engage with the world differently in our dedication to mission, to service, or to simply living the principles of the good news? May these ponderings and lessons be with all of us this week.
answer us when we need you. But our call was something like cheating, or self-neglect, or feeding an addiction, closing ourselves off from others, or not being able to get out of our own way. We forget you. Or we are so angry because we think you know our pain but do not love us. You give us room when we are in distress, but no, we don't want to feel alone. We regret our twisting ways and have, that have followed us offers of help that do not heal, rather than the offers from others whom you have sent to help us. We put our trust in you. We put all that disturbs us into the shining from your face and find what is good. Because of you, we love with gladness. We share all that we have with others. And we lie down to sleep in peace, trusting that you answer the call of your every sleeping child. At this time, we bring our own prayers and petitions before you in the silence of our hearts. grateful that you hear us when we pray. And now we join our voices together praying the prayer Christ taught his friends and followers saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into